Hey, this is Rebecca Dirks with PremierGuitar.com. We are here talking to Nels Klein at a Wilco show, and we're going to check out his gear. Obviously, you're known for the Jazzmaster, so uh, you want to talk about this one here? Well, this is my main Jazzmaster. This is the first one I ever owned. I bought it from Mike Watt, uh, my friend, inspiration, fearless bass player. And uh, it's 1959. I've broken virtually everything on it at some point. Uh, except for the knobs and the pickups. And uh, it has a mastery bridge, as virtually all of my guitars, Jaguars and Jazzmasters, have the mastery bridge, so the strings don't move around. I've played it a lot. It was black when I got it. I've almost kind of worn a good groove in here playing behind the bridge. Uh, broken pieces off the headstock when I fell on my guitar. Um, but... The reason I love Jazz Masters is the, everything about the shape, the feel of the guitar, the sound, and strings behind the bridge, and virtual indestructibility. So, uh, hence my Jazz Master fixation. Yeah, that one's taking a good beat beating yeah, there. Yeah, it's, it's got a little wear. And uh, when I got it, I didn't know anything about slapboard fingerboards. I, I didn't know this was such a great guitar. I used to throw it around mercilessly. When I was playing with the Geraldine Fibbers, this band I played in after I played with Wad, and then uh, I realized after playing other jazz masters that this was a particularly good one. <laughs> but I also have another 59 as a backup with Wilco that's just uh, stained black. It's not the original finish either and has a mastery bridge on it. It's somewhere back there. Um, and what kind of strings are you stringing that up with? All my guitars except for my uh, fake Telecaster and my Jerry Jones Shorthorn have GHS-12s. Oh, wow. mm. Those guitars have GHS-11s because I want to get a little more twang, a little more note bending. I don't do a whole lot of note bending, more with Wilco than in my own music, but uh, also I play pretty hard, so I like a little resistance. It's the only thing I like about Jazz Masters is the extra string length you know, more tension. And so do you tune all of these standard? Yes, I have one guitar that will pull out okay. uh, of the box that's not in standard tuning, and I have one that was made by uh, Bill Hentz and Tim Thalen here in Des Moines that's a Rosewood version of a Jazzmaster style guitar that I keep in drop D. Well, but, let's check out some of these other guitars. Okay, let's get to that one. This is the what I call the Rosewood Monster. I was approached by Tim Thalen and uh, his buddy Bill Hentz about building me a Rosewood Jazzmaster because they had seen Jeff Tweedy playing his Rosewood Telly. And I thought that, well, for one thing, that they were insane. But beyond that, I thought, sure, why not? And they came up with this guitar. All I asked them to do was uh, put equidistant cross inlays in, which they later told me was a total pain in the ass because um, I like equidistant crosses and no, I'm not Swiss. And um, they asked if they could put a Strat pickup and because they had had someone come into the shop that they have here called the Luthery, um, and they'd had very good success adding this uh, Strat pickup, and then I can access it with this little switch here. Um, it's a little bit like Pop Staples. He had a had it there. It's probably not the best spot. They put it in a better spot, and um, it's all rosewood. It's chambered, so it's not ridiculously heavy. But as as you can see, it is all rosewood. So. Um, and I play it in drop D, which with Wilco would be songs like Theologians and a song on the new record called Whole Love and uh, uh, God, I, um, Sunken Treasure. And that way I don't have to be jumping around tuning like I used to. And uh, I play this one really almost all the time because it sounds marvelous. These are Duncan Antiquities, which I really, really like. I think they're modeled on the good sounding Jazzmaster pickups. Um, but it's a little heavy, frankly, for my, I have neck and shoulder issues, um, but uh, beautiful. I'm very lucky. It has vintage tremolo, which I find works better than the ones they're making now, uh, which is, these are getting harder to find, but worth the effort. And a C, the Mastery Bridge. So is that a uh, Fender Strat pickup? Uh, this is a Duncan, yeah. This is a very unspecial guitar to the rest of the world, no doubt. It's a, a faded you know, Les Paul uh, double cutaway with P90s that Jeff Tweedy gave me when I joined the band that he'd gotten from Gibson for some very, very small amount. But it's a guitar I play in open tuning. This is GG, 
D, G, G, D. It's a lot of G's. Usually I tend to tune them a little more like that, a little out of tune, but I play it on, um, I used to play it on Kingpin. I played it on a song called I Might from the new album, and it's, I play it with a bottleneck, and it sounds something like this. <laughs> I like that with the unison strings, any little bit of angle I get on the bottle will make beats and slightly in and out of tune, you know, like this. See, I like that sound. And it's indes virtually indestructible for a Gibson, although the headstock did snap off at one point, as I guess they always do. And I also have added um, U.S. Uh, postage stamps, Cesar Chavez and James Baldwin, to my guitar because I'm so impressed and amazed that they got their own stamps. I think it's a beautiful thing. But this is my uh, Jerry Jones Neptune 12 string. He made uh, Dan Electro style guitars out of Nashville. He retired uh, early this year. Um, I like this Neptune. It was a variation he came up with during a lawsuit about the Dan Electro shape and, uh, and look. Uh, a lawsuit which he won because the man who had the Korean uh, rights didn't have the rights but anyway he made this in the interim and I like that it doesn't look exactly like a Dan Electro but I love Jerry Jones guitars all of them because they're like Dan Electro's with the beautiful lipstick case pickups and the cheap you know hollow uh, you know they were always made out of cheap materials but with this great sound a lot of personality and it's also one of the speediest uh, 12 strings to play I've played 12 strings since high school and played a little Rickenbacker in high school but uh, Never played a 12-string that, that played as easily and it sounded as glassy and delicious as the Jerry Jones. So I play this every night with Wilco, um, particularly on songs like uh, I'm Trying to Break Your Heart or Box Full of Letters, um, Camera, Pot Kettle Black. I'm playing this guitar. But it's just, you know, you've, you know the sound. It's just, I usually put my compressor on and just really beef up the sound. and. <laughs> guitar. Well, I'll show you the next one, which is the weirdest Jerry Jones guitar. I'm dying to know the story of this guitar, but I saw it online. It's a Jerry Jones double neck, a longhorn, but a very unusual one. It had to have been made for either somebody famous or someone he knew, because it's all white, which I've never seen him do before. I've never seen 12-string and baritone neck, which is what this is. Extremely weird. It's one of one. It has inlay. You can get a shot of the inlay. Planet Earth, Cloud, um, my favorite, um, God and Adam's hands from the Sistine Chapel <laughs> um, copy, you know, the sun rising. It's very kind of, I guess, uh, a little bit hippie, tribal. Um, but who wanted a 12-string baritone double neck, right? Um, it's got the wood bridges. My man Woody in Minneapolis, who designed the mastery bridge I was showing you, carved this, hand carved it so it's totally in tune. And um, I bought it really as a collector of Jerry Jones and then realized that we had recorded a song on the new Wilco record that I had no idea how to play live because of the overdubs. It had a low tune guitar part and 12 string and that I could just switch back and forth on this guitar but I didn't buy the guitar with that in mind so it's a song called Dawned on Me and I'll just show you what I do as I play a uh, little boost I play the baritone riff which is the low tune guitar thing that goes I switch. And 
I go back and forth, I solo, and I have this other line I play that's like... You know, this, and then I go switch back again, and I play it live every night. Who knew? I didn't know. Jerry's retired, and he's not answering his email anymore, so I'm dying to know the story. If anybody knows the story of who Jerry built this guitar for, I'm dying to get the mystery solved. Maybe we can help you out. This is a Japanese crown guitar uh, that my friend Norton Wisdom in Los Angeles painted for me. Um, he paints live while music happens. A lot of people across the country know his work. Uh, I've known him since 1980. He was painting live with a band called Panic back then, but uh, I got him into this project I was doing with Mike Watt and Stephen Perkins and Willie Waldman called Banyan. And so he started painting on stage with us, and he just was bugging me to let him paint a guitar. And so here it is, and I just gave him total carte blanche to do whatever he wanted. He always writes no war on everything and always wears a t-shirt that says no war. Um, my, the back of the neck is really <laughs> hilarious. You know, hopefully I won't get too confused. I'm just starting to figure out where to play this. I'm going to put some different pickups in it, I think, though, to give it a little extra oomph. But uh, it's just got the Norton iconography in spades, religious and sexual and uh, iconic art. These are his drawings, um, all this stuff. And uh, there it is. This is a 60s Hopf guitar, H-O-P-F, from Germany. Everyone's intrigued by this guitar. It's uh, very luxurious of me to be able to play these guitars uh, live. I record with guitars like this quite often for their weird tonal qualities um, and don't bring them out on tour. I just have to not have that many guitars. But now, of course, in Wilco, I'm completely enabled since Jeff has twice as many guitars as me on tour. Um, and people love the look of this guitar, as do I. Um, so I'm playing it on Art of Almost, which I'll show you why, and on a song called uh, Capital City on the new record. I also played this on the album, Wilco the album, on a song called Country Disappeared. Country Disappeared, you can hear this nasally tone. So it has this kind of, you know, that really throaty, nasally sound. But also on, on a Art of Almost, I play behind the bridge, uh, it's an F sharp minor to E progression, I play this pattern that goes So, uh, no other guitar has those notes behind the bridge. My jazz masters, I specifically have the bridges at certain heights, so I know what notes these are, and I use them all the time. And in this guitar, there's so much string length, as you can see, that there's actually different notes than most normal guitars that have strings behind the bridge. And uh, that's one of the qualities I look for in most of my electrics, is these string, this string bit, not just this. Um, and that's the story of, and of course, uh, typical of German guitars of the period, like also Hofner's, all these roller uh, controls rather than knobs which gets really confusing. Um, just all this stuff going on. It all works on this guitar. I think I got this, I can't remember if I got this from Mike's Music in Cincinnati or not, but they have uh, a, a lot of nice, funny, what I call ugly duckling guitars and, uh, in addition to their usual stuff. So here it is, the Hopf Telstar Standard. It looks kind of like a laminate, you can see, but it's not. It's like, look at this wood grain here and how it, it's, you get splinters on this thing, basically. It's like a baseball bat, but it's light. But it's pretty fun, right? Really weird. Uh, what are you using for the strap lock? The oh, these are just from Grolsch bottles. You know, the little uh, Euro-style, what do you call that, apparatus that just pops off, and they have this as a washer on there. Um, and actually, Grolsch got wind of this and started sending us beer nice. <laughs> at one point so we could get a lot more of these, but they work pretty well. It makes it harder for the guitar to fall off, which seems to happen to me all the time. This is, embarrassingly enough, also the Nels Klein signature strap that soldier straps made that they were selling at our merch table with my signature on them. But basically, you can go online and design your own straps, and the woman that owns the company uh, 
was getting response for this design that I had with the hearts that I chose. And so she decided that I should try to market it. <laughs> they don't make them anymore, I don't think. It was a limited edition. But I still can order them and, and get her to make me some of these. I, have, I think all my straps except one are soldier straps. This is a 1969 Fender Jaguar that somebody painted uh, their version of Aztec silver. It wasn't originally this color. Um, and put this mirrored pick guard on it. This is the most rock and roll guitar I've ever owned as far as its appearance. Uh, and my sort of guitar guru friend, John Woodland, Woody, and I conspired to turn this into a sort of an experiment by putting a Duncan Charlie Christian pickup in the neck position which is an idea that I copied from Jeff Tweedy's, uh, one of his Telecasters. And, uh, and then we got Duncan to wire a super hot Jaguar bridge pickup, because these are really loud. So they're more balanced now. It turned out that the internal wiring, somebody had epoxied to the body. So th hence the, uh, the endless headaches of getting this guitar up and running, which is why it's called the Silver Bastard. But the... Uh, um, the long and short of it, besides the experimental and, I guess, rather glamorous nature of the instrument, is that it's, it's turned out to be very loud and, and a very, very good sounding guitar. And so I basically tend to use it just for a clean sound. So it's just like, it's just a really huge tone by itself with no, uh, you know, no drive, no anything. So for, uh, for rhythm guitar type stuff, it's like, it's just really present, really loud. And of course, strings behind the bridge, mastery bridge, the usual. When Wilco was playing in uh, Seattle uh, last year, Bill Nash showed up and he makes these kind of distressed looking, uh, what are essentially kit guitars that they make into kind of cool, now called relict guitars. And he gave me this guitar. Um, I'd been avoiding going the tele direction for well, all the, the years that I've been in the band, because Jeff and, and Pat in particular is a tele guy, Pat Sansone, who stage left guitar. And um, in spite of the fact that when I play certain songs, I, I try them on every kind of guitar, and Jeff would say, you know, conventional wisdom says that those, those songs should be played on Telecasters. And I was like, oh, I can't. But anyway, I, then when, when Bill gave me this guitar, I love the way it looks. It's got Lawler pickups in it, which scream. They're really loud. They sound amazing. And the guitar feels really good. And I just absolutely love this guitar. And I'm playing it on uh, perhaps obviously some of our more country-inflected things, along with my Jerry Jones shorthorn, which I use for twang and spank, as we like to say. Um, and it's also, uh, I have set it up with 11, so it's more of a note-bending guitar. It, it speaks on basically from top to bottom and it's even got a cool sticker on it of a cowgirl riding a pig <laughs> which I just love I frankly love that it plays in tune um, you know I think you they just take these guitars and beat the hell out of them and then sell them but uh, um, it's really cool looking guitar too I think I love it looking over here looks like you've got your Schroeder head up there yeah Tim Schroeder of Chicago uh, makes a very small number of amps. He's also the owner and operator of a guitar repair shop, Amp Repair, and he's an expert on Leslie speakers. He's kind of an overachiever and a perfectionist, but he uh, brought some amps to the Wilco Loft one day, and I played his 40-watt, 35-watt head um, at Jeff's behest when he heard what qualities it has. It sounds like that's in your wheelhouse. So I tried this amp, and it was absolutely blew my mind whatever it is he's doing not just tubes but capacitors that sustain and also I'm always looking for a kind of low mids rich sound trying to get rid of treble not too much treble um, it just was an amazing sounding amp which we have as a backup for me now because then he decided he wanted to design an amp for me and so I said sure okay go ahead so this is it the DB7 um, I now have three, one that's uh, 20 watt that I record with, um, but this is, this is it, I asked for the red box, no Tolex, he, uh, 
It's about 35 watts. He asked to put all these features in it. I said, can you make it just volume, treble, and bass? And he said, can I please put in mid-range and presence? And then he put in this uh, little treble boost if I want it, which is nice for 12-string. Or I can defeat and add a little extra low. It's kind of a cut switch, actually. There's also an attenuatable boost, which I'm not even using. You get a latch switch there, and you can just set this and just drive the amp harder. It's not an overdrive channel as it as it's not a separate channel, it's just a boost. Um, but that coupled with this uh, Marshall cabinet, which I uh, bought from Jeff Tweedy, uh, I was using the offset JTM45 Marshall reissue that goes with this. They made 250 of them about, I guess, about eight or nine years ago. Uh, and that's the amp I was using when I joined Wilco. Jeff said, just, I'm not using it, here you play it. It sounded good and it was beautiful. But uh, the cabinet is amazing. It has these Celestians in it that they only made. They're blue backs that they only made for this cabinet. There are no spares. The only way our, our loft manager and tour manager, Jason, could get more speakers was to buy another cabinet on eBay or from Marshall or somebody. They had an extra. <laughs> but uh, I haven't blown the speakers in almost eight years, which for me is amazing. Uh, so it's just beautiful tone, handmade uh, amp with this... You know, I think the cabinet's frankly too big. It's too big, too loud, too much sound, but it sounds so good. We just sort of pointed away from everybody. <laughs> and I think he's only made uh, 30 DB7s in the course of three years. And I think he's managed to sell them all, but I can't imagine that he makes any money on them because it takes him so long to build them. Um, they're not cheap. You know, I did get a discount. And then I add these items for decoration. This is something I got in Amsterdam when I was going to move to New York uh, to be with my uh, wife-to-be. And this is basically supposed to be me because it's got blue eyes and hearts for eyes. It's in love, obviously. And it's moving to New York. This is some kind of napkin or tea towel that has points of interest in New York from something like the 1800s. And then uh, Rilakkuma, the relax bear from Japan, in an endless series of marketing schemes. They even have Rilakkuma guitar picks in Japan. And a Japanese fan gave me some, knowing that, uh, that I love Rilakkuma, not as much as Mike Watt does, but I do love Rilakkuma. And so I s glued it to the amp. I haven't told Tim yet. <laughs> <laughs> now he knows. So what are you making the cab with? Well, I'm told it's a Sennheiser 609, but our man, Stan Doty, Stan the man, uh, chose it, and I trust him implicitly. Sadly, happily, strangely, I seem to be known for using a lot of effects pedals. Um, for me, they're like colors on a palette. Uh, they're not a gimmick, and they just help me realize, I guess, various tones and uh, nuance, subtle nuances, as well as uh, create sounds that don't sound like guitar. So um, what I've got here, I guess the main things that I always use are some sort of an overdrive, a compressor, a volume pedal, and some maybe some delay. So this is the exploded version of those parameters. So I like this Boss volume pedal. It's, I don't break as many of these as I used to of other volume pedals, and it seems to be basically as transparent as a volume pedal can be as far as not ruining the sound. But of course people ask me, with all these all in a chain, which they are, although my guy Junior Paul Garrison in LA put the sequence together, that's most advantageous from his perspective. Once again, he's the expert, I trusted him. Um, it does degrade my sound. You know, people say, doesn't that mess up your sound? I say, yeah, you know, degradation is my sound. So if I get a decent tone with all this stuff, who cares if the sound is degraded? I'm not a purist about anything. So why would I be a purist about guitar tone? So the volume pedal, uh, I started using when I in the 70s uh, was checking out people like Steve Howe of Yes and Robert Fripp and King Crimson. And then later guys like uh, John Abercrombie and Bill Frizzell became very well known for using the volume pedal. And uh, I do all kinds of things with it, not just violin effects or not just simple bringing the volume up and down. It's also there for me to defeat any 60 cycle hum. I just always have my foot on it. So when I record in recording studios, it's invaluable because I prefer single coil pickups as a rule. And uh, it definitely controls the recorded noise factor of, of 60 cycle hum, if anyone cares.
Um, so basically, you know, with the straight tone, you know, I have this sort of thing, but I had to go to treble and add my cheap boss compressor, which people laugh at, but I still love, particularly because it just squishes on with their latch switch thing. You can hear the difference there, right? And I can, you know, sustain. So that's a, a must. I love the uh, the deja vibe here, which is we're not going in any sequence, I guess. You know, Hendrix put a little delay on here. That's the sort of band of gypsies sound which doesn't always come in so handy with Wilco, but it's nice to have under uh, the fingers and the feet. I always use the Zvex Fuzz Factory, which most people recognize as being really strange and intense and uncontrollable. Um, I think it has an amazing sound, and also you can do, and I'm sorry, sir. Um, <laughs> fun with all my toys wow. everywhere I go I have fun <laughs> um, so yeah so it's basically 69 fuzz the germanium fuzz sound I prefer this one <laughs> you know and this is a Greek pedal by crazy called the starlight it's kind of a distortion much like a rat but a little bit better <laughs> Anyway, it's, I feel embarrassed now playing. This is their crazy uh, clean boost, which I really like. It's almost as good as the Allen Yee clean boost, but the thing, reason I'm trying it right now is because it has a parametric EQ function. So I have it all thinned out if I want to. This is the Magna Vibe. I used a lot of Magnatone amp uh, vibrato, or it's actually tremolo that sounds like vibrato. Um, with Wilco, I prefer to record with uh, an old Magnatone amp. And this is the only pedal that tries to replicate that sound, which is kind of a wiggly. And then, then the Electroharmonics Pulsar for tremolo which I like because it's incredibly versatile I have a lot of other pedals that do tremolo but I and the pulsar can be a little bit too much in a live setting because you could just look at it and it changes its sound but uh, it has a lot of different tremolo sounds mm -hmm. and it doesn't doesn't have too much drop in volume it doesn't have the beef that some have that's nice where they be they, they beef up your mid-range to try to uh, circumvent the loss of gain when you turn it on but it's a cheap pedal and it's great. Electroharmonics makes so many amazing pedals that aren't expensive and are kind of weird and visionary and they've always done that. Uh, the linchpin of my sound generally tends to be the Klon Centaur Overdrive which has a kind of legendary status um, almost infamous at this point because they're impossible to get and cost a ton of money but I got this uh, way back when the same one I've had it for years. Henry Kaiser turned me on to them. Also, he turned me on to the Fuzz Factory many, many years ago in the, in the 90s. So you hear me play on Impossible Germany or on uh, uh, Ashes of American Flags with Wilco. I'm soloing on the Klon for my overdrive sound. It's like having an amp in a pedal. It's basically has a very kind of transparent quality uh, and it's very flexible. It can be used as a clean boost. 
Uh, it's got plenty of gain, and um, I love it. And also the other one next to it, the vibrato pedal, the old Boss vibrato from the 80s, which I use constantly with Wilco. Oh, I'm just messing around. This would be like the ashes of American flag sound with my holy grail reverb over here. It's like... Love the vibrato. It's a little too much reverb, sorry. Um, and then the whammy pedal. Um, I prefer the whammy one, but but live with the lights in it, uh, sure, I'll go for the big monster reissue that's not a reissue. And I'm, I use, uh, you know, sometimes the low octave sound for uh, something like uh, Shot in the Arm, where I basically have this... <laughs> Monstrous sound. I have this fifth sound. So those kinds of goofy sounds that we all associate with harmonizers. Um, but then the other thing I really like about these is fuzz factory plus two octaves down equals end of the world. fun with that. You can get out of tune clusters by just setting it in between and uh, sometimes you can just set the amp, the guitar on the amp and just hit it and fade up the fuzz factory, put on some, this is my chaos pad I use for tape delay effects. I haven't blown those speakers. I know, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> this is the old Electroharmonic 16 second digital delay, not the reissue. It's always recording. I do looping with it on the fly. I can drop sounds into the loop by defeating the infinite switch without destroying the loop. And I've used this since 1985 when Bill Frizzell showed it to me. Uh, he's the master of it, by the way. And I just use this old Chaos 2 for uh, echoplex and space echo effects just by touching the screen and changing the settings here. It's a DJ device, it does a million things, but um, uh, I just use, use it for that. Sometimes harmonizing, uh, out of tune harmonizer especially sounds good for sick loops like I just had. And this is the Electro Harmonics Ring Modulator called the Ring Thing, but also does harmonizer things. And the Electro Harmonics Deluxe Memory Man, it's the reissue, not as cool as the original, I guess, but I'm not a purist. And I use it for a little bit of bounce and that wiggly that it has. I like wiggly. It's psychedelic. That's why I like all this stuff. Color. Well, this doesn't get used much, but it's a, it's a, a Bleep Labs thingamagoop. Um, it's their first one. They make a bigger one now that has more stuff. So I can just put my quarter inch phone jack into, into it, turn it on. It's got a light sensor and run it through my stuff. It doesn't like too much light.
fun for the entire yeah, family. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. It looks like you have a you have a blast. Steel. I play lap steel with Wilco, and I have my old national. I forgot to talk about, but um, I just played in standard tuning because I'm a tourist on the lap steel, and this way I can play in every key and do my fake pedal steel effects by using open strings and and whatnot. And it's made late 40s, early 50s. I never remember the model name of this national lap steel. It's really quiet and, and really, really gorgeous. Uh, I, I always use this one. I have a few lap steels, but this is... And thank God it has this silver, shiny uh, stuff against black because when it gets really dim lighting-wise on stage, man, I get really lost. You're playing lap steel or bottleneck, you really want a little light on stage. So this way I can at least fight the darkness by kind of turning it and trying to find the, the spot to put the bar play in tune. It's always nice. I think that's pretty much the whole, the whole thing. I've got my, my bottlenecks. They're just, you know, I use, I use uh, the bottom part as well. I like them roughed up and I make effects with them on the strings, disgusting effects that make people cringe, as well as my spring, which I play behind the bridge and on the guitar, uh, somewhat in the manner of a bow or somewhat in the manner of a, uh, I don't know, a saw. <laughs> That's really the story. These Dunlop Ultex, they're like, what is it, 13, what is it, one point, what does that one say, point. is it one four? Okay, they're heavy. I like really heavy picks. Can always play lighter, but when you play too heavy with a light pick, it's pointless. It doesn't get any heavier. That's it. Oh, and I didn't mention my hot cake, the Crowther hot cake, made in uh, New Zealand. It's just for creamier, beefier overdrive, really mushy compared to the sort of more transparent sound that you get off the Klon. Um, and uh, it's what I use on Shot in the Arm. It's what I use on my solo on Muzzle of Bees. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Real quick before we wrap up, uh, what what are uh, kind of cables are you using? Oh well, generally, except for the connector cables on the uh, on the board, like that red cable there, it's made by Gil Divine in Portland, Oregon. Divine Noise, and this is a Divine Noise cable. That's why it has my name on it. <laughs> and uh, he does guitar teching for Yola Tango, and approached me when I was sitting in with them last uh, Hanukkah during their big Hanukkah run, and said, you know. Those cables you're using, I said, you mean the really terrible ones? And so I, I got some from him. They have apparently had the same cables in Yola Tango that he made for them seven years ago. They've never broken. Um, that's impressive to me. And so far, so good. And they're very high quality as far as sound specs and all that stuff that I never know about. <laughs> well, thank you so much thank for taking us through and, and making some great noise for us. It was awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks for your interest. This is Rebecca Dirks for PremierGuitar.com.